Today I show you seven ways to sharpen your skills in Photoshop. Now whether you've tried out these seven pro level techniques before, or whether they're totally new to you, every one is a skill that will serve you well as part of your regular routine. And naturally, I save the best for last. I'll start with an image that's near and dear to my heart anyway. That's great composition in my humble opinion. However, the image quality leaves something to be desired, which is why I could correct for the obvious color cast by going up to the image menu and choosing one of the auto commands, which believe it or not, according to Adobe, rank among the top 10 most used features in the software. Crazy as that is, auto color actually works really well for this image couple of problems. First of all, it's a destructive modification, so I just rewrote every single pixel inside the image, and it does what it does. I can't customize the results, or can I? I'll undo that change, and I'll click on the black-white icon at the bottom of the Layers panel and choose either Levels or Curves, either one. I'll go with Levels, and then locate the Auto button. There it is, and press the Alt or Option key and click on it. In order to force the display of this dialog box, notice these so-called algorithms. Every one of them corresponds to one of the auto commands. See that tooltip over there on the far right-hand side, auto contrast. This guy right here is auto tone. And this one is my beloved auto color. That's only half of auto color, however. The other half is this checkbox. I'll go ahead and turn it on. And that is the exact same effect we saw just a moment ago, applied non-destructively as an adjustment layer. But it gets better. Let's say, I want more highlights. I'm going to clip 1% of the histogram, let's say. But more importantly is that my wife's flesh is still kind of purplish. Well, I can adjust for the color cast by clicking on the mid-tone swatch right there in order to bring up the color picker. And then I'll just take up the saturation value so I can get a sense for what's going on. That's going to infuse red in the image. What I want to do is infuse the color complement of blue, which is a color cast, by taking the hue value up to 20 degrees. And we get this effect right here. It is a custom effect, so I don't want to save this as a default. However, when I click OK, Photoshop's still going to say, hey, do you want to save that as a default? No, of course I don't, you nutty program. In any event, notice what I've been able to achieve. This is an entirely non-destructive modification that I can edit anytime I like, and I was able to customize the results. And by the way, if you're liking what you're seeing so far, won't you take a moment to subscribe and turn on notifications? You'll be glad you did. Now let's talk about getting rid of dust inside of a photograph. What we're seeing right here, all this debris, is what's known as backscatter. And the idea is on dry land, the sand stays on the beach. Underwater floats all over the place along with all the other stuff you find underwater. But in your photographs, it could be any form of detritus. And so what a lot of folks recommend is that select the pixel base layer, of course, and then go up to the filter menu, choose noise. Now in a perfect world, we could just choose to speckle. The problem is that it only gets rid of single pixel noise. You can't change that. Adobe either give us control over this filter or get rid of it. It serves no purpose. It hasn't for the last 30 plus years. Whereas dust and scratches is just kind of a mitigated experience. You can average neighboring pixels by cranking up the radius value. So that's great. And then to bring back the detail, you crank up the threshold value. This is measured in luminance level. So you're basically saying if two neighboring pixels are 40 or less different from each other, don't change them. If they're more, then do change them. The problem is, I'll go ahead and apply that change. Notice that it does quite the number on Colleen's face. So we have all these weird, sharp, harsh transitions here. That's because it's an on-off proposition. The same with this detail right here. You can see it's it's just not a good way to work. What is a good way to work? Step number one, convert the image to a smart object. Step number two, go up to the filter menu, choose noise once again, and then choose median. It's the same as dust and scratches, except it doesn't have the threshold value. So I went with eight pixels. That sounds great. It definitely gets rid of the goobers in this zone and elsewhere inside the image. But of course, it also blurs the detail, which is not what we want. So what you do is you double click on this little slider 
icon right there. And that brings up the blending options dialog box. Either your dust is going to be darker than the stuff around it, in which case change the blend mode to lighten, or it's gonna be lighter than the stuff around it, as in my case, in which case you change the mode to darken. And notice that gets rid of the goobers there, the backscatter, and it keeps the good stuff, generally speaking. It still will blur some things. It'll gum them up, in which case you've got a filter mask right there. Click on it, then select the brush tool and make sure that the foreground color is set to black as it is in my case, and then just paint in the stuff that you want to protect. All right, this next one is half advanced technique, I suppose, and half permission to do whatever you want with unprofiled images, such as this photograph from the DreamSime image library, link in the description. Notice that we're seeing a hashtag up here in the title tab, which means there is no color profile. And unprofiled images are common as mud. They include third-party images, images from the web, images from sources unknown, in which case, you're you're kind of working without a net. You can't necessarily trust your color modifications and so forth. And so if you see a hashtag, do take a moment to go to the edit menu and choose assign profile, but you don't have to assign working RGB, which is gonna be sRGB by default. You can have fun. You have my permission to select profile and set this guy to either Adobe RGB or Image P3. Try them both and see which one you like the best. Notice the difference. Watch his jacket. It's dull one moment and now it's popping, which I like. At which point I'll click OK. Nothing dangerous about doing this. I haven't changed a single pixel inside the image. I'm just changing how Photoshop is interpreting it and the hashtag goes away. Now at this point, you want to follow things up let's say you're preparing the image for the web or for a device then return to the edit menu and choose convert to profile and then what you want to do is set your profile to working rgb not cmyk rgb srgb is fine if the third checkbox is available turn it off and click ok and this is before and this is after and i ask you which one is more fun Hey, real quick, do all these tasty skills make you hungry for more? Still more coming in this very video, of course, but just so happens I have two more after that. Only they're not technically in Photoshop, they are exclusive to Camera Raw. One is Denoise, which just keeps getting better. And the other is the brand new reflection removal, which makes windows, you know, reflections on glass windows absolutely disappear. And I cover both at my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash deke now. Seriously, these are two features that will blow your mind as they expand your creative opportunities. All right, now let's take a look at the best way, I think, to clean up a mass that you create using Remove Background. So another image from the Dreamstime image library. I'll click Remove Background, and a moment later, it's a miracle. It goes away. That's awesome. However, let's say I want to turn this thing into a YouTube thumbnail for this specific technique right here. Well, Tradition, such as it is, dictates that I assign a stroke to my bearded dragon. So I'll go ahead and do so. And I will crank it up to 10 pixels thick for now. Outside is the position, the color is white, and so forth. Now I'll zoom in on the creature's nose. And notice this thing is not 10 pixels thick. It's like 32 pixels thick in, in spots and it's really super lumpy. And so the first thing you wanna do is go up to the filter menu, choose noise and choose median, the great smoothing function in Photoshop. And so simple, so eight pixels, sounds great. That means it's gonna average eight neighboring pixels at a time. And so I'll click right here and then I'll zoom in so we can see its nose and notice if I click and drag around, this is before, very lumpy, and this is after, very smooth. At which point I'll click OK. However, that's still very thick. And so if I double click on a stroke right here and take it down to one pixel, what gives? How is this one pixel thick? If I drag right here, you can see that it's like 14 pixels thick at this location, but it's kind of variable. So how do you make it more uniform? Well, the problem is that the mask is soft. And so select the layer mask, very important. And then the best way to firm it up is to go to the image menu, choose adjustments and choose levels, control or command L. And then this is just a recipe. You can play around with it, but it works so well. 100 for the black value. And then tab past the gamma value, 
to the white value, which is 255 for, by default, change it to 155. So take it down 100 and click OK. And we have this nice firm one pixel stroke, at which point I don't really want it to be that thin. So I'll double click on it and take it back up to 10 pixels like so. And so there's a lot of different ways to smooth out masks inside Photoshop. This one just happens to be my favorite. All right, now for a quick one. How do you best achieve smooth gradients in Photoshop? The answer may surprise you. I'm going to alter option, click on the eye in front of the gradient layer. And can you see it? We have bands of color. You should see horizontal bands right here but what i'm going to do is zoom in a little bit and it should become a little more obvious each stripe of color is represented as an independent band what we need to do is mix things up so i'll double click on the thumbnail for this layer and you may figure method Deke, it's set to perceptual you absolute fool set it to smooth instead and uh, actually, that doesn't help at all. That just redistributes the bands of color. What you need to do is introduce a little bit of noise in the form of dither, which for some reason is turned off by default. You want it to be on, and that's going to give you a much smoother result indeed. All right, now for techniques numbers six and seven, which I consider to be highly experimental, but also very interesting. And so let's say what I wanna do, I'm gonna hide the properties panel for a moment so that we have more room in the layers panel. And let's say what I wanna do is turn off this stroke. And instead, I kinda wanna blend between the edge of the lizard and its background kind of fudge the difference and i'm thinking i should be able to pull that off using the remove tool combined with generative ai and so i'll create a new layer and i'll call it blend edge let's say and then i will start to paint around it this is the painful part is i'd have to sit there and paint around the entire lizard like so i'm doing it in multiple passes because i have sample all layers turned on and remove after each stroke turned off by the way so that's great but it's still going to take me more time than i want what i want to do is paint around a path outline and so i'll escape out of here and in case you're not familiar with this feature because it's so very awesome i'll press the control key or the command key on the mac and click on the thumbnail for the layer mask right there to load it as a selection outline then i'll switch to the paths panel i'll drop down to this icon right here make work path click on it and i'll double click on this guy to name it outline let's say now i don't want to see all those anchor points and so i'm going to click off of it and then click back on now i'm going to start things off this is technique number six by the way i'm going to start things off by showing how this works with the spot healing brush notice sample all layers is turned on i'm working with content aware because that's the best technology it has and my brush size is 40 pixels and now all i have to do is press the enter key in order to trace that path isn't that awesome and now i'll click off the path to hide it i'll switch back to the layers panel this is before and this is after so it does a pretty cool job right i'll go and zoom in a little bit here you can see that it's trying its best to fudge the difference between the lizard layer and its background. And then it's not that good, but still. And then I thought, well, maybe it'll look cool if I change it to the screen blend mode. Wow. Isn't that awesome? But what I really want to do, of course, is invoke the remove tool, which is much more powerful. So I'll turn off that layer and I will create a new layer called remove tool. In case this isn't obvious, we're on to technique number seven, by the way. Problem is, as much as I would like to select the remove tool and then switch to the path, click on it and press the enter key, that's not going to work. It's going to make a mess of things. And that's because I'll click on the hamburger icon and choose stroke path. I want you to see that among the many tools you can use to stroke a path outline, and in case you're not familiar with this feature, it's absolutely awesome. You, you can brush along a path outline, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but notice what's missing here is the remove tool. And so this is of no use to us. I'll escape out. We're going to have to figure out a workaround, and I've got one. Here it is. Press the control key, command key on the Mac, click on the layer mask thumbnail once again to select it, and I will 
drop down to this little brush icon in the taskbar and choose select border. And I'm gonna go with half the value. 20 pixels instead of 40 pixels that I use with the healing brush. And that's because this, there's some flexibility involved. You'll see. And so I'll click OK. And now what I can do is I can increase the size of my cursor like crazy. I'm going to be painting with the remove tool. Sample all layers is on. Remove after each stroke is off. And so I can just be as sloppy as I want because I can paint inside of a selection outline. Isn't that great? And so I can just, you know, sit there and, and, and paint like a fool inside this region right here. And then when I'm done, I'll press Control H, Command H on the Mac to hide the selection outline. Actually, I missed a point right there. There we go. Is there anything else? Nope. And now I'll press the enter key in order to invoke the change. I am going to see a progress bar because I'm calling on generative AI. Good news is it only will take one credit, by the way. But it also takes its sweet time, about 45 seconds in my case. And now let's see the difference. This is without that layer and this is with and so it has done a very admirable job of blending between the foreground. Notice we lose all these ratty edges here between the foreground image and its background. And it is possible to do with the remove tool, assuming that you're painting inside a selection outline. And so what do you think? Is that not the bomb? Naturally, if you have any thoughts, similar or otherwise, comment below and then subscribe and turn on notifications. And for two more skill sharpeners that rely on the latest in AI, join me at Patreon com slash deke now and then go to deke.com and sign up for my newsletter i'm deke mcclellan this is deke now